Hello, my name is James Trost, and this is A2 Insight. Today's guest is Professor Scott Page of the University of Michigan. Dr. Page uh, holds the chair of uh, the position of Leon Hurwich, Collegiate Chair in Complex Systems, Political Science, and Economics Departments. Scott Page, welcome to A2 Insight. Thanks, it's great it's to be here. Bit of a mouthful. Uh, sure. We're going to cover a lot of stuff to, uh, as we go through our, our discussion here. But first, I just want everyone to know that the reason I have Dr. Page here is we're going to discuss further in this book his wonderful new book called The Diversity Bonus. But before we get to that, for all of our right. local fans here, let's find out a little bit more about you, where you grew up, your background, and let's get you to when you finally ended up here at the <laughs> University of Michigan. All right, well, this is my second go-round at U of M. So I grew up in a place called Yankee Springs, Michigan. My family had a gas station on Gun Lake, which is one of the bigger lakes um, in Michigan, and I went to U of M as an undergrad. So uh, not many people from there actually, you know, come here. So that was a, a bit overwhelming, you know, at first. And I majored in mathematics and um, originally started out, I think, you know, going to get a PhD in math. And so I went to University of Wisconsin, and then I got interested in game theory, and I moved to... Northwestern, so I studied game theory at Northwestern, and then got a job at Caltech, which is kind of where everybody in Ann Arbor dreams of going, Pasadena, right? And so when I was there, I kind of became the unofficial economist of the Rose Bowl, which is a lot of fun, and then in 2000, moved back to Ann Arbor, which is great. So my family was still, um, you know, living on the other side of the state at that time, and that was great. So it's really, so this is my kind of second, second go around. Mm -hmm. Well. For those of us who may not necessarily be aware of it, could you explain to us exactly what game theory is? You mentioned in <laughs> sure. mathematics that this is a, what is game theory and, and why were you attracted to that as, uh, as an interest? So what game theory does is it's the analysis of strategic behavior. So these could be political parties choosing candidates, these could be countries in war, these could be sports teams deciding on a strategy, this could be a game of chess, right? And what, what you've got is you've got a set of players who are the actors, and they have a set of strategies or actions that they can choose. And what they try and do is choose an action that's going to be good given the action the other person's choosing. So the difference between a game and a decision, in a decision, it doesn't matter what anybody else has choose. So at the restaurant, decide what to eat or what sport coat to wear, nobody else is affected, right? But in a football game, if Harbaugh decides to run, it matters a lot what Urban Meyer thinks Harbaugh is going to do, right, in terms of how he's going to position his defense. And so in a game, you kind of have to drive the other person, right? You've got to think, what is the other person thinking I'm going to do and try and outsmart the person? And so what game theory does is sort of turns that into, takes that sort of general idea and places it on sort of firm mathematical foundations. That's sort of the goal. And uh, now, do you see, and that, can that be a, a predictor then? I, I guess, I mean, is this... The human mind is a, a fairly, it's not a mathematical construct. Right, right, right. Uh, what is it about, what, how is game theory useful as a, I mean, you've studied this academically, why, why, right, right, why right. would this be a useful uh, knowledge for any, like an organization, a sports team? Sure. What, what, do you, what would be the practical application of game theory? So there's a bunch. So one is you use it actually to decide on actions, right? So if you're trying to sit and think about, okay, what action should I take in this, set, this situation, you might sit down and think, okay, what are my alternative choices? What are my opponent's possible choices? What are the payoffs to each of us if we choose those particular things? Right? So you can actually use it to figure out what should I do in this situation, right? Should, if you're a firm, like, should I raise prices? If you're a political candidate, should I go negative? Right, that sort of thing. Second thing you use it for is to design systems. So like when the FCC um, auctions off the spectrum, like all the cellular bandwidth for cell phones, that's a really complicated auction to design. The people bidding in that auction are, you know, big players, right, AT&T, Verizon, those sort of places, and they're going to be super strategic, right? They actually hire game theorists to figure out how to bid in the auction. So the government hires game theorists to figure out how to construct the auction. Mm -hmm. The other thing you use it for is, you know, you can explain empirical phenomena. You can try and figure out, like, you know, why did we, you know, why are we seeing companies do this? You know, for example, why would you see a company offer its product for free initially, right? And then you might realize that the reason why is they want to get a bigger market share early Right, and then get other people to pay later, and sort of get a sort of first mover advantage against other companies. So there's a lot of people who study strategy in business schools, mm -hmm. who also study. So the sort of designing, predicting, right, figuring how to act, those are all there. My own interest in the field, because I was, you know, became involved very early on, was also just to kind of have fun and explore, right, to sit and think about, you know, what is sort of 
optimal behavior here? What is strategic behavior? How would a strategic person act versus a sincere person act, right? And how do you design institutions in a way where the strategic thing to do is the sincere thing to do? So if you can construct an institution where the most strategic thing you can do is also honest, that's fantastic, right? Because then you're sort of creating a culture of honesty, you know, and you don't have, people don't have any incentives to sort of cheat and lie. So when you talk to scientists at NASA and you say, okay, here's a point in space, how do you describe it? Some will say X, Y, some will say R theta. And it turns out each of those makes some problems easy and some problems hard. Like explaining the orbit of a planet in X, Y is hard, right? Explaining this table in R theta is more difficult. So what they know from solving a lot of hard engineering problems and scientific problems is it's really useful to have multiple representations of physical space to solve problems. Well, the same is true with any social problem. If I'm thinking about what, let's, so let's take, for example, what's the value of Amazon? So I'm an investor, and I'm thinking, okay, how much should I value Amazon at? Is it worth $50 a share? Is it worth $500 a share? Well, then you have to think, what is Amazon? Is it a delivery company? Is it a website? Is it Sears? Or is it an information company? Right? And each one of those are different perspectives on what Amazon is. And each one of those may give different valuations of Amazon. And so where wisdom comes from, and also where accuracy comes from in this particular case, is by having a lot of different perspectives. So what I try and do in the book, and what I, what I mean by cognitive diversity, are things like different representations of the problem, or different problem-solving tricks, right? So if you're a computer coder, and you're, like, you may learn six different ways to find bugs in computer code. I may learn five different ways. If my five are different than your six, together, we know 11. If my five are the same as your six, or a subset of your six, together we know six. And so what you get when you just sort of like try and very you know, kind of carefully, dispassionately, non-politically think about, you know, what makes groups perform well, mm -hmm. you see that it's got to be differences in how we see things, how we go about solving things, the models you have in your head, the dimensions you focus on. There's a lot of work on, you've probably had people on the show who talk about sort of human biases and implicit biases and bounded rationality and that sort of stuff. A lot of psychologists think about that in sort of what they call an inattention framework. There's just certain things we don't pay attention to. Well, one of the things that you think about from diversity is like if you and I pay attention to different things, like with your training as a media person, like when you watch me speak or see someone else speak or see someone's body language, you think about that very differently than I do as an educator, mm -hmm. right? I've got a much more didactic perspective and you've got a much more sort of entertainment perspective probably, right? Mm -hmm. And together we could probably help someone become a much better presenter, mm -hmm. right, than we would individually. So that's kind of where um, the, where this project emanated from and what the bonus is all about. Like, mm -hmm. it's differences in how you think, how you see, what you emphasize, how you solve problems, and it's really useful. Okay, and that, that, that certainly is, you know, when we think about just the concept of diversity, and I think a lot of people think of the term diversity as it relates to just specifically ethnic diversities and, and identity. other and things, right. identity issues, because I guess the other thought is you, you can, you can, well, we can look at various organizations and find the Supreme Court, all of the people have all gone to Harvard Law School or Yale Law School. Right. The men who went to the moon were all men who right, had right, right. one commonality. So I guess the, assuming that I, I wanted to create the perfect diverse, cognitively diverse organization, right. how do I, I mean, you know, it's not like I can come into a job interview and say, this is what I mean. How, how can you yeah. literally quantify or bring aboard people with a diversity that's not necessarily on paper r relevant to a career. I mean, this is, you're asking for a diverse group of diversity that isn't necessarily valued, at least in the, right. in the traditional sense. Right, where, right. Where do you, how do you get there? <laughs> so I think, I mean, this is an empirical question, mm -hmm. right? So one can theoretically sketch out sort of what types of diversity might be important for a particular problem, but then mm -hmm. empirically you've got to ask what would be true, you know, what, would I, what might I be looking for in terms of diversity, you know, in terms of like sort of background diversity that would translate into sort of the germane cognitive diversity. Well, let, let's stick yeah. with the Amazon example. Yeah. Okay. Let's. So let's. let's yeah. Mm -hmm. So let's do. But let's think of. I, I've sort of used three buckets. So one bucket would be this. One bucket would be identity diversity. I mean, so the fact is, is that um, if someone's, if two people have you know different genders, different race, different sexual orientation, different religion, 
that's going to mean that they've probably read different books, had different life experiences, right? So that they're just going to see the world differently. They're going to kind of go with the world differently. So that's going to be one dimension. The second dimension is literally just the experience you've had, like where have you lived? Like my family ran a little gas station on the lake, right? That gives you a certain set of experiences that is different from somebody else's. Um, and then the third thing that matters a lot is, you know, training matters a ton, right? In terms of like, and, and even simple things, like I did this with, um, some of this was with NASA, some of it was another company, where we just pulled up syllabi from courses. Like, if you, it turns out if you pull up uh, like fluid dynamics from Illinois, Michigan, and MIT, advanced fluid dynamics, you'd think, look, that's the same course. It's got to be the same course. And it's not. Mm -hmm. Like at MIT, they actually study windmills in their fluid dynamics course. Mm -hmm. and, and the reason why is because then they go from there to propellers. Mm -hmm. Now at Illinois, they're like, windmills are in the air, forget that, right? We're not going to do it. So, so literally, training would matter a lot. So if you, let's go to the Amazon example, right? How you were trained, like if you were trained in marketing, if you were trained in um, industrial organization, supply chains, all those things would affect how you looked at that that business and evaluated it, right? So too, though, would your life experiences, right? So suppose you'd worked in retail, or suppose you'd worked at Google, you'd come and you'd look at Amazon in very different ways, right, just based on those sort of lived experiences. Also in terms of, suppose you lived in a rural area versus a city, right? You'd think very differently about sort of, you know, what Amazon's cost might look like and where their growth potential might be. And then the last thing in terms of identity, I think you'd think deeply about, you know, how is how are people going to respond to, you know, buying things online versus buying things in person? How should you know Amazon present itself? How should they, um, you know, even just design of the web page? Those sorts of things. Different people from different groups are mm -hmm. just going to sort of see those things in different ways. I mm -hmm. think, right? Absolutely. I mean, I mean, I, I can certainly see the advantage. Of that, but it, right. I think it's to get. You have to have a. I would think, particularly at a leadership level, you'd have to have people that see that, instead of the. I, I think one statistic I found here that even today we have, uh, seventy-two percent of all senior executives in Fortune five hundred corporations yeah. are white males. Right. Now, you know, again, the world is changing, and that that won't be the, the case. Congress changes, yeah. people change, so there is diversity through just demographics. Right. We but can help. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> that's right. I mean, it's that, better. That may not necessarily No, 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 because right. otherwise we're not going to everybody to be CEO. Right. But, but right. I mean, that's, that's right. you know, just given that mindset of particularly those that run the, right. how do you as a trainer, how would you instill in a 55-year-old CEO of a multi-billion dollar corporation who's used to having people like himself, right. went to the same college, same university, studied, got his MBA at Wharton and all this other stuff, right. how do you convince him in this fictional world, or rather this realistic world, right. how he's going to benefit from those identity aspects when he's not used to even interacting with that, those folks. Right. So there's, I think that the, again, rather than sort of, you know, rather than be a proponent, when I'm in those situations, what I want to do is I want to kind of just sort of lay out a logic, okay. right? Mm -hmm. So I would, I would not, like if I go into, you know, BlackRock or Google or Ford, it would be presumptuous of me to say, hey, here's how you should select people, right? Because I don't know enough well, on the ground. I'm, I'm right. saying educate them. Yeah, but educate them. Right, right. So in terms of though, how do you, um, what ideas do you put before them? Mm -hmm. So there's several. One way you want to think about this is you want to say, if you're restricting yourself to 30% of the population for your you know, C-suite, mm -hmm. do you really think you're going to get the best people? Right? You know, Because white men are 30% of the US population. Mm -hmm. and so right away, they, they have to think no. Right? Mm -hmm. Second thing you want to ask is, you know, do you believe that there are, you know, is your, are the people you're selling to, are the people you're trying to hire, is the culture, you want to, not only in your C-suite, but the organization writ large, you want to have access to the full pool of talent, mm -hmm. right? So that means you need to understand that pool of talent, and you also want to have, understand the full market base you're selling to, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's probably going to be the case that identity diversity is going to matter at some level, right? So is experiential diversity, so is educational diversity. The thing is, identity diversity correlates with experience, mm -hmm. and it correlates with what people take at college, what they train in, what work experience they have, those sort of things. And so you're just, you're limiting yourself in terms of what kind of talent you're going to have in the room. And 
And what almost what most companies realize now is the world has changed, right? Like most value now comes from cognition. It comes from people thinking, not from people just making stuff. And so that all of these places are in fierce competition to get what they think of as the best people. But they're also, I think, recognizing that they, they want to get sort of cohorts and teams of people that enable them to perform really, really well. And so what the point that I you know, frequently make is if what you were doing was easy, you wouldn't be making a lot of money. <laughs> That's point one. Mm -hmm. Point two, you're not that smart. Nobody's that smart. And so if everybody in your room is agreeing, mm -hmm. you must not be hearing the full story. Because by definition, this thing is hard. Mm -hmm. And you're all saying, oh, yeah, this is what we should do. And there's no dissension. That's a canary in a coal mine. That's a sign that there's a lot of groupthink. And so you actually want to be the, the, the most successful leaders I've met, you know, they want to be in rooms where there's disagreement. They want to have, you know, sort of, I think, really productive friction where a lot of things are being discussed. And if, if they start to discuss something that they think is going to be complex, difficult, to, you know, this is going to be a tough decision, and everyone agrees this is what we should do, then their first reaction is we need to get some other people in the room, mm -hmm. right? Because this shouldn't have been that easy. Mm -hmm. And so I think that that, you know, they recognize, you know, we need people from different industries. We need people to understand different consumer bases. We need, you know, we also, one reason I think that companies are looking towards sort of diversifying in the identity dimension is that these corporate cultures, right, depend critically on leadership. Mm. And they, rather than think, I think companies 10 years ago, they said, you, boy, you know, we're kind of bleeding, you know, we're losing women and we're losing people of color. They're not making those promotions. Now they'll say, we're losing talent, mm. right? And we're losing talent that's correlated with these identity factors, maybe for cultural reasons. And we got to fix that because they can go to LinkedIn and they can see the people who left. Mm -hmm. Because you know, before they could tell themselves a story, well, those people couldn't handle it. right? Now they go to LinkedIn and they look and say, the person that couldn't handle it is now vice president at Citibank. Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so I think reality is staring them in the face mm -hmm. that people departing on the basis of identity are often people departing on the basis of talent as well. That is interesting, and I, it does, I also think about this in terms of when you're thinking of organizations in, in, in general that, you know, why is one successful and one isn't? Uh, one reason that some, you can, there's a bottom line associated with a corporation, but then you're yeah. also a political scientist, uh, Dr. Yeah. Page, and one of the things that I think most people would agree <laughs> on, and I, I think you probably anticipated this one, Who knows? Uh, government agencies, government organizations, services, is this diversity bonus applicable to the governmental section or even let's take it a little further the nonprofit or is there something uniquely concentrating about a for-profit organization that can become more diverse and have a bonus that isn't necessarily available in government so let me start with the nonprofits I think that they're really extremely careful and sort of forward-looking on trying to get these sort of diversity bonuses. So if you look at like the Michigan Council of Foundations, which is just a fantastic organization, you know, they like to have leadership that includes community activists, CEOs, you know, educational leaders, and people from the community. And part of that is to have sort of buy-in, you know, at the community level, but also to tap into, you know, all the knowledge, right? So Nancy Cantor, who used to be provost here and is now president at um, Rutgers Newark, quotes a woman from Rutgers, or from um, Newark who had said, um, I put my head down on my pillow here every night. Right? You people just kind of come in. And there's, there is a lot of local knowledge in these communities. And so when you think about what foundations are, often, are typically trying to do, especially those that are trying to you know, um, alleviate things like poverty and improve educational systems, making those decisions without people who have the on-the-ground experiences mm -hmm. of the existing institutions and previous institutional fixes is just a mistake, right? So I think, I think that they're way ahead of the game. Hmm. In terms of um, government, government is fascinating. So there are some agencies, I mean, you and I could go walk into the FDIC or the Federal Reserve System, which are, you, know, you could argue, maybe quasi-governmental, or the Army Corps of Engineers, or the Justice Department, and you would be, wow. Mm -hmm. These people are National Science Foundation, NIH, incredibly talented, incredibly diverse, really tapping into all these different ways of thinking things. Then you could walk across the street and go to Congress, and you might come up with a very different, you know, might have a very different reaction, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that the, um, I haven't spent much time in the halls of Congress, but I have been at, have been at these other places, which that itself may be informative. But the, uh, 
No, but I think in Congress, the, they've got the wrong type of diversity, and they, they have diversity of preferences. Right. So mm -hmm. if you and I want different stuff, then we're not going to put our cognitive diversity to use, right, to help one another. So one of the things is you, you have to get some agreement on mm -hmm. what is it we're trying to do. And then once you get that, right, then what you can do is you can start making progress. So today, a very optimistic thing in the papers was that um, the government seems to think, I think correctly, that there's a lot of people in jail who shouldn't be in jail, right, for minor drug offenses. And people from both parties recognize this. And so now smart people from both parties have found something they can agree on. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's the only thing, but at least one thing. And they'll work together, and I would imagine they'll come up with something pretty darn good, mm -hmm. right? The problem is, is when they disagree on what they want, then they're not putting their, you know, their cognitive differences to use to find something better. Well, that, that, that's encouraging for uh, those of us who look to study uh, somewhat dismay how government functions or does, doesn't work. But yeah. one of the things that interesting, when you're talking about diversity, it comes in different buckets, as you right. described. There's identity, right. there's all sorts of talents, as you call them, right. skills. And yet we also compete on a global level. Right. And right. there are a lot of cultures and, and uh, places throughout the world that aren't necessarily diverse by design. Yeah. Uh, you've got places like China and India. They don't have much of a history of diversity. Uh, yet at the same time, they have access to the world's technology, which in by itself right. is diverse. So I'm, I'm wondering, I want you to put your prognosticator hat on this as it relates to, I mean, we, we all this whole concept of global challenges and right. global economies. Does the United States, given what you believe is the diversity right. bonus, and that's really the concept of our entire culture as right, people, right. will we have an advantage? Or is there necessarily, is there a negative that may, that you get from necessarily being yeah. diverse? Right. So first off, I mean, I was in China last time. China is incredibly diverse, right? In India as well, but you could argue that governmentally, institutionally, they've tried to tamp that down as opposed to embrace right. it, right? But, but culturally, you know, right. well, India has got hundreds sure. of languages, right? Mm -hmm. But the um, the U.S. has absolutely benefited mm -hmm. from you know sort of global diversity. I mean, you look at like I, you know, I can't pull up the data out of my head, but like the number of you know. Startups, like the, if you think of the unicorns, the billion-dollar startups, the number of those started by immigrants or first-gen, um, you know, U.S. citizens, is incredibly high, right? So we're tapping into people, are brilliant people around the world, right? See the United States as a place where they can really make it. They have freedom, they have possibility, you know, and they can do incredible things. And so I think that we've really, um, I think, benefited from global diversity, maybe more than any other mm -hmm. any other country. The, the question, I think, though, is in the long run, right, how do we continue to, like, you know, how do we continue to have an educational system? How do we continue to have a culture that really prizes people continuing to think about things in really interesting, different ways, mm -hmm. right? Well, and I guess, that, you know, I guess I think about that having been Asian. There's a collectivist mindset Oh, yeah, no, that's also, right. Yeah, we agree, uh, in right. that part of the world, which, and, and this is, goes back to one of the questions I wanted to explore, yeah. too. And, because you know we can always say great minds think alike is a phrase that <laughs> right, is, right, right. is something, but also great minds are one that create great inventions in yeah. the history of our country, not groups of thanks. It's usually one individual who comes up with this idea, whether it be the automobile, the airplane, yeah. and these people then tend to uh, stay too long <laughs> in some instances running organizations. Right, right, right. Uh, and yet it's also what entrepreneurialism tends to, at least currently, has been a uniquely uh, an American phenomenon as we look at what who, the Google and Facebook and even, in the, you know, right. it's amazing. Apple's another example right. of this. Uh, you said we may be uniquely qualified. How, at the same time, we do have biases and various yeah. other from the past. So what, can you give some, if, if let's, uh, and, and the, I, I am someone who's trying to compete in a, a difficult marketplace. Let's not go on the world stage. And I, I, I've got, I don't have a diverse workforce. Right. I mean, can can you give a, a specific example? You use NASA right. or something, but I mean, just like a, even a, a, a concept or something that you've normalized that has totally benefited an organization by virtue of implementing this this formula of understanding the the nature of a more profitable or better organization because of, of the diversity bonus. Yeah. So, I mean, first on this on this question of um, is it individuals, right? This is a this is a question that you now people are going back and looking at in a really hard and deep way. And the reason why is a lot of great inventions and a lot of great ideas, it turns out multiple people have had at the exact same time. And so people are going and looking at 
patent data, like a, a, a physicist who's an organizational theorist, Hai Jin Yun, who's looked at um, like sets of patents and ideas that are out there. So then there's big important patents, but some of them you can predict. Mm -hmm. This was, you know, all the Lego pieces are there, right? And it's because somebody's just got to go, ah, there they are. And you may have multiple people within a series of weeks all propose the same patent, mm -hmm. right? And so, yeah, we give, you know, we have a tendency to give people credit, right? But the average paper in physics now has like 12 authors, mm -hmm. right? And so when we give, and we'll say, oh, here's this famous person who wins the Nobel Prize, but they, we could have given it to 50 people. Right, even like writing movie scripts now are usually written That's by right. tons and tons of people. So it's not, but it's just, you know, you know, you and I talked about this before a little bit. I mean, people reason by narrative, you know, mm -hmm. somewhat. Right? We like stories, and we like to say, oh, here's the person that, you know, or like, or here's Crick and Watson, or here's Alexander Graham Bell, or here's, you know, whomever, right? Here's Barbara McClintock, you know, doing, you know, genetics. But the fact is, you know, scientists now work in these huge teams, mm -hmm. and we just want to give, you know, we want to give credit to one person. But like the iPhone, was not developed, there's no Alexander Graham Bell for the iPhone. There was a giant team of people that were kind of locked in a room that they couldn't talk to anybody about for, you know, I think years at Apple mm -hmm. that developed that thing. And we can't, we can't assign any name to those people even, right? I mean, Johnny Ivey gets some credit, but for the most part, it was this incredibly diverse team that sort of, uh, you know, got bonuses. Mm -hmm. In terms of what organizations do, this is a, mm -hmm. I think the, the story here of, is that this is, small step after small step after small step where you change your mindset about how do we, um, how do we sort of um, get better decisions, take better actions by recognizing that diversity matters. So for instance, here's, here's one sort of clean example. Google gets almost four million applicants a year. Hmm. I mean, just think about that, right? Just for a moment, right? If you, and you could do a calculation. If they read one per hour, they, mm -hmm. by the time they get done hiring, the business would have closed or something. Mm -hmm. So. How do you do that, right? So they figured out, okay, well, let, we're big, we're Google, we got lots of money, we can experiment, we can figure out how do we do this. So they use sort of really sophisticated techniques to get that pool down smaller, hmm. right? And then they, and they realize that one thing that really matters a lot, it's not grades, it's not test scores, but it's kind of an interest and an ability to solve problems, right? Mm -hmm. So problem solving ability matters. Mm -hmm. And they like to get people who solve problems in different ways, so they sort of seek diversity. But how do you find those people? That in and of itself is a hard problem. Mm -hmm. So they said, well, people differ, right? So let's have, let's have people interview and see if that works. Mm -hmm. So they've got the best AI in the world. And then if you, so let's suppose you take a, they have a, a set of employees and they say, here's a baseline employee and they've got some success rate. How much better do we do if we have a person who's obviously different than an algorithm mm -hmm. also interview? And the thing is you get 26% better. So instead of being 50% baseline, you get 70. But then they had, hey, it's like that Dr. Seuss book, one apple on top, sure. two apples on top. Two, like, what if we have two people interview? Mm -hmm. And then it's like 82% better. What if you have three people? 85% better. We have four people, 86% better. Mm -hmm. And then it stops. And so what they realize is that like, you know, so it's like this nice little curve. And it's like, so there's a diversity bonus from zero, you know, from 50 to 70 to 83 to 86. And then you have 15 people interview. You're only at 87%. It's not worth it because there's really no more sort of signal that you could, that you can sort of extract from the information. But that's just a flat out, diversity bonus, right? Mm -hmm. So you, what you're mm -hmm. seeing, a lot of places do not, with all this AI stuff, people sort of think, ooh, AI is mm -hmm. changing, and it is, but it's really being used in some sense to create this same sort of bonus in a way. It's a very different way of thinking than humans, mm -hmm. and when you combine the two, you often get um, big bonuses. Other things companies do, um, mm -hmm. I think super useful is they'll say, some do random coffees, Right, where you randomly, once a month, if you sign up for this once a month, you randomly interact with someone from another part of the firm just to see, like, are there ideas that are spreading? Some have done things um, that I've met with, and again, I'm not naming the companies because sure, of non-disclosures, sure. right, mm -hmm. where they've said on their key performance indicators, what's the most important decision you made for the company this year? Mm -hmm. And then below it, they ask the question, who from outside your normal circle or silo or stovepipe, whatever metaphor they <laughs> used, did you talk to before making that decision? With the idea being is that if you're making an important decision, we want you to be getting diverse mm -hmm. feedback, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's, I think what, what you're seeing, and again, it's hard in the business context. People often ask, show me, you know, yeah, show me right. the data, show me the data. The problem is, let's go back to the game theory thing. Sure. Mm -hmm. We're competing. You know, so you're Pepsi, I'm Coke, we're competing. We could both be doing really well in diversity space, and then we're going to still be making the same profits. Mm -hmm. 
But if either one of us wasn't doing well in that space, we'd be doing less well. So it's, mm -hmm. it's yeah, really it's, difficult. It's, yeah, it's really difficult to sort of look at data and then say, mm -hmm. I can prove definitively that right. this gives you a big. But it's right. fascinating, though, too, because you're really, I think a lot of people in the world don't really, particularly if you're looking for a job, uh, they, don't, they don't necessarily tout their problem-solving skills or how they're even, how they relate to the larger world and see right. that there's a value to their identity and their experience. So, I mean, it sounds to me like one level, people need to, to, they need to adjust how they approach the marketplace to get a job. No, absolutely. You know? but how do you do that? Yeah, they are, but it's, it's kind of like, you have to kind of go full Walt Whitman and be like, you know, here I am in full, right? But um, Laszlo Bach, who used to run the people team at Google, he was, mm -hmm. he was teasing me one time about how Scott has said, you know, you are not a vector, you're a toolbox, in the sense that, like, you know, I'm not a thermometer, I'm a, I'm a toolbox, in the sense that we tend to think, like, okay, let's think of college admissions for a second. Like, oh, like, there's SAT score plus grade point average. That's your ability. So I can, like, line people up from, like, tallest to shortest or something, or, you know, smartest to dumbest. But the reality is you're this, like, toolbox full of things. Like, you know, you know how to fix a car. Or you know how to use, you know, macros in Excel. Or you know how to, like, run a sophisticated camera. Or, you know, you know there's things, you know, so there's this set of things you know how to do. And this is kind of like Reed Hoffman's dream, right? LinkedIn, think of LinkedIn. Right. What do you do on LinkedIn? You're badged kind of for all these skills, right? right? And if you work at, like, here's a, a company that's way ahead of the curve on this, IDEO. Like, within IDEO, you literally get, you know, sort of badged or, you know, approved for a skill in, like, leading teams, you know, meeting with a client, designing a survey, you know, so there's a whole set of, like, literal, like, you know, like, it's like you're allowed to use the chainsaw sort of thing if you worked at a construction company. Um, and if you think of yourself that way, it's really freeing because you think that like, for me to make a contribution to the world, for me to do something sort of meaningful and useful and productive, what do I need to do? I don't need to score this high on this test, right? I don't need to have this, this IQ because you're kind of maybe born with that. You need to build a tool set, right? And a set of experiences and a set of ways of thinking that it'll enable you to do what you want to do, to contribute to what you want to do. And, the, and one of the ways, going back to the diversity thing, that you'll be able to contribute is to develop different sets of tools mm -hmm. than other people, right? And if you have those different sets of tools, you'll be you know, super useful. So paradoxically, mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. I'm bringing mathematical tools into the space of diversity, which most people don't, right? So I'm literally following my own advice after the fact. <laughs> <laughs> well, and it is, and again, we're, we're near the end here, but I, yeah. I just, I, I'm gonna have to push a little bit on this because I'm yeah. a former director of admissions at a university. Yeah. So, you know, I, uh, having a, a different set of tools is one thing, but we also have to have some objective Oh, analysis, yeah, 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 yeah. And, I, and I guess I, yeah. it's not to negate that, but I mean, this kind of does dovetail with the whole concept of, if I'm trying to look at various candidates for a position, this one went to Harvard, this one went to Wayne, you know. Yeah. And it, it, it's not easy because you're, we want to give strength to the diversity itself, but then there's also objective m m knowledges of, of predictors of success. Right. So I, I guess, you know, not to put you in an admissions committee meeting, right. but how, how would you take someone with auto mechanics, somebody who, you know, is into, does woodworking or, uh, you know, wrote a play in high school right. that may necessarily got a 28 on the ACT and everybody else has a 32. And then this is maybe more of a practical question right. as it relates to this, and I don't know if anybody ever asked you this, because some, because someone asked to implement this. Right. How, how can you weight these things, I guess is the question. Right, so they're working really hard. So I've met with um, the presidents of several, you know, Ivy League schools mm -hmm. and admissions people, and they've, they're they thinking about how do we do this? Not implement my ideas, but just how do they sure. work through this process? Mm -hmm. And also with, you know, you know, people who do hiring at places like, you know, Google and PIMCO and BlackRock and that sort of thing. So let's first turn to the hiring part of it. Mm -hmm. There are certain things that if you've done as an undergraduate, so let's suppose that you went to an elite school, you know, Princeton, Michigan, UCLA, Wisconsin, MIT, whatever. You got an honors degree in physics, and you were the star of the basketball team, or you were you know, in student government. You did something else, mm -hmm. and you got an honors degree in physics, and you, they won't even care about your grades, mm -hmm. to be honest. I mean, they might. And if you got good grades to boot, fine. They know, I mean, the success rate of those people is unbelievable. Because, no, because you know they can master really difficult material. Mm -hmm. They've got an incredible work ethic. And you also know they're very healthy, right, which matters a lot sure. for performance. Mm -hmm. right? So those, everybody competes for those people, right? When you get 
you know, when you start then looking at, you know, people who sort of aren't the for sure things, then what companies do, that I think the most enlightened places, and this is also what college admission places do, is they try and predict probabilities of success. And this is where there's a difference now between like Princeton and let's even say like, you know, Ohio State, Wayne State, whatever. So Princeton gets, you know, probably five to 7,000 applicants a year who they estimate will graduate from Princeton with 99% probability or above. So the only thing that will prevent them from not graduating would be some sort of personal tragedy, right? you know, some sort of health issue or something, right? And so then the question is, how do we choose among those 7,000 to pick the 1,400 we let in? And there, they actually seek out diversity in some ways. Now, they also take legacies, which is they shouldn't right. do, right? But they, but they also, but they're seeking diversity, sure. partly because they want to fill butts in seats in sure. their departments. But if you look at a Wayne State or if you look at Ohio State, um, there, when they do those probabilistic models, they may not have a five to one ratio of applicants to uh -huh. you know, number of slots they've got, that they've got a 99% chance of getting in. Mm -hmm. And moreover, in order to get people to an 80% chance of getting in, they may have to you know, give those give people a lot of money, right? To make you know, because because family income is a predictor, so it's a very different calculus, right? In those situations, and I think that in if you're an admissions officer at a school that I think is really you know, in, in terms of making America equal, Wayne State and Ohio State are doing a lot more than Princeton is. Let's be honest, just in terms of the number of people, but there you've got to think about where do I place my bets? Right. Given you know, Princeton has what I don't know, 18 billion, Wayne sure. State has 300 right. million or something. So. So there it's much more of a, how do I place my bets? And I think their um, identity and, uh, and geography and things like that come into account because you want to sort of try and, I think they're, it's the normative argument, right? They want to make a more equal society. And that's good because I, I think anybody looking, when you're, if you're looking for a college, the most important thing I, I think in terms of a, a place to attend is the one that has, what is the graduation rate of an institution? Right. Because the fact that somebody gets in doesn't mean they're going to make it. Now, it would be nice to have a 99% yeah, yeah, yeah. predictor of success yeah. if you get into Princeton yeah. or even Harvard or Michigan for that. Again. Where, as I said, one other, one other question I want to ask you, yeah. because this is interesting before we uh, wrap up. Uh, what is next for you in, uh, in the future, whether it be in your writing? I mean, we've got this book coming out. I right. know you're doing other words. What, what are you working on now to take us into this? Are you staying within this area? Are you moving into other areas of interest? What are you currently working on? In terms yeah, of so it's, it's actually a super exciting uh, mm -hmm. trade for me. So I, for the last 10 years, I've been working on this book on models, right? Mm -hmm. It's called The Model Thinker. And it's about how we use models and how we use ensembles or collections of models to make mm -hmm. good business decisions, policy decisions, understand the world, sort of achieve wisdom in some sort of way. And I've been, I was working on that book for seven years, and the Mellon Foundation came to me and said, you know, would you write a book on diversity, and so I stopped that book, which was difficult to do, finished this, and now that book comes out uh, right after Thanksgiving, so November 27th. And um, yeah, so I'm really excited to see kind of what, you know, it's coming out with basic books. This is the first time I've actually done something with a non-academic press, and so, we'll, you know, we'll see. So it's gonna be interesting to see sort of how that plays out, but the, you know, the point of the book is that, you know, we're awash in data. We have so much data. And so what models do is they give us formal structures on which we can sort of array that data mm -hmm. and then make sense of the world. So we can reason better. We can you know, make wiser actions. We can predict with greater accuracy, right? We can think through things. And so I think that there's been a perception that, oh, we got all this data. I no longer need to think. I think the opposite is true. The data gives us, you know, in some sense, this landscape on which we can throw the sort of formal structures of models. So I think models are. Um, on the rise, that's my guess. Well, we could go on longer. I really only really touched the surface of this, but I want you to know thank you very much, Dr. Page, for being here. Everyone, this book, the diversity bonus, uh, the, uh, the credits, we will have uh, what chance to be able to find out where you can get and read this. It's a fascinating read, uh, particularly those who may be into mathematics and enjoy various <laughs> graphs right. and, and things like that. Uh, I want to thank you very much for being on A2 Insight today, Dr. Page. Thanks. And, and uh, I look forward to reading what, uh, your, next, your next work. So, Thanks. Thanks again for A2 Insight. I'm James Trost. Until next time.